All right, we're ready to go live, uh, show. Um, want to kick us off, please. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Chodo Zono, the current chair of the New Portland Foundation. Welcome to our very first uh, uh, community session, uh, Latino community. And uh, our mission for our foundation is to promote the goodwill amongst the First people in the community, the government agency, nonprofit, pardon. So I want to welcome everyone to our very first um, uh, public session. We'll have five sessions similar to this. First one starting with the Latino community. I'm going to turn this over to Paulo Catlani, the executive director of New Portland Foundation. Paulo. Okay, all right, bienvenidos, everybody. Um, my name is Ronald Latang Sayang Catalani. Um, I'm from uh, uh, the Republic of Indonesia during that time when our country uh, was shifting from uh, having been ruled by either Imperial Asian or Imperial uh, European states. Uh, the part of the country I'm from is uh, close to Las Filipinas. So we share a similar patois, uh, which includes Portuguese, Spanish, Bahasa Indonesia, Bahasa Malayo, Tagalog, Chinese, and so on. Um, my role is as interim uh, ED of New Portland Foundation. What we are looking for with our work is uh, an assessment of what is really the cost of immigrant integration. What is really the cost of justice what is really the cost of um, inclusion. Uh, we know that uh, we have built models of immigrant uh, resettlement and immigrant integration that's based on uh, community-based organizations taking about a half of the money that it really does take to integrate people into the economic, the social, uh, educational and justice systems and so on in America. Uh, we know we do that because as immigrants and refugees, people like everybody here around the table will go ahead and do what we do for free. If folks are getting paid for their work, they get paid half of what a public employee would be getting paid for it. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and work past five. We'll go ahead and work on weekends because we need the affection and respect from our communities, I guess, more than we need money. So our work will be to convene uh, government, uh, philanthropy, and communities uh, to uh, map out, uh, now that we're in, in a bit of a, an abyss in our communities and an abyss in our uh, economy and the mainstream, what's it really going to cost? And when we rebuild, let's do this in a more compassionate and more sustainable way. Okay, so uh, I want to uh, acknowledge for sure that uh, we are always partnered and supported and cared for beyond our dreams by Muslim Educational Trust. And we have fit this work into um, what's called the Professor Dr. Uh, uh, Nohad Tolan um, Cultural uh, Silk Road Cultural Diplomacy Series. So this series at MET has invited summits of Pacific and Asian Americans, uh, African America, Native America, uh, Latino uh, Americans, and I think Linda Castillo was the uh, MC, the Zarina of that event. Uh, so thank you again, Linda. And Linda is again tonight to help guide us through this event. Um, let me move uh, to introducing you real quickly to our board of directors. The board of directors of the New Portland Foundation is intergenerational, interethnic, uh, as much uh, cross-gender as we can manage. But our mind uh, is always on succession. We are a generation of grumpy old guapitos, and it's time to move on to a brighter, um, uh, more shamelessly ambitious generation of of leadership, um, women leadership. Uh, our board chair you've met, this is uh, Big Uncle Sho Dozono. Sho Dozono has been around for 50 years as a civic activist and business activist, 
transnationally. He has brought, without overstatement, millions of dollars to our state uh, and a large chunk of that to the city of Portland. He ran for mayor and we all gloriously lost together. Uh, Blake Good, Blake Goud in, the, in Dutch, is the treasurer and interim secretary. He's the co-founder and chief compliance officer of Markham Asset Management, uh, an asset management firm that, among other things, uh, specializes in Islamic finance. Alan Euler, folks may know, um, is the president of Onsite HR Services, also a long-term business leader, civic leader, uh, and we love him a lot because in Washington County, when he was stake president of this region's uh, Church of uh, Christ Latter-day Saints, they were uh, honored several times by Washington County Board of Commissioners uh, for their work on immigrant integration and LGBTQ integration. Um, also, folks may know LDS Church has done an outstanding job of integrating their church members from all across the world uh, in, into economic mainstream. Uh, Jack Hanna, you all have met earlier, I believe. Um, he's the, our vice president, a retired attorney from Pennsylvania, and a, uh, that's right, no pencils are made, right, Jack? Yes. Yes, uh, that's correct. And then a big uh, Democratic Party apparatchik out on the East Coast, which is really why we love him here, because no one else loves politics like Jack does. Uh, Melissa, you've all known. She's been here trying to crack whip on the rest of us as we sort of bumble around. Uh, she's a practicing attorney in Washington County, I believe also in Clackamas and Multnomah. Is this correct? And so this is that next generation of uh, leaders uh, who we are so happy to hand off. Uh, our baton to uh, Dr. Allison Davis White Eyes is the Director of Community Diversity Relations at Oregon State University. Uh, Allison, are you with us? I see your face. Uh, she's not far. So yes, I, I am here. Thank you. We have a long history in our uh, ethnic streams with uh, Oregon State University presidents, and uh, we are so proud of the work uh, people like Allison. Uh, and the other education offices, ethnic minority education offices, have done in, in, uh, in just changing, uh, uh, paradoxically, the look of Oregon State University. It was a time when we were on the Board of Visitors there, Hector Inojosa and I, when they used to take pictures, stock pictures, of the quad or other kids laying around studying, and they bought those pictures. Those were not young people going to OSU. So when we looked carefully at those pictures, at those black and brown faces, and we couldn't recognize any of those children, you know, we confronted them with this. And so we thought we would help them do better by getting them real students. Uh, Rania Ayub is a youth force Youth Workforce Development Coordinator at the City of Hillsboro. You all may have known her as a Civic Engagement and Public Relations Director at Muslim Educational Trust. Uh, Hector, you, you know, uh, Reverend Dr. Wajdi Said is the founder and president of Muslim Educational Trust, which includes Oregon Islamic Academy. I'm going to turn out uh, over to Wajdi Said. Sorry, it's prayer time. Uh, 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 who's our physical host for this evening, for this event. And I'm going to turn to uh, Wajdi Sahib uh, to elevate our conversation before we dive into the dirty work. Tuan Wajdi, Silahka. Thank you very much, uh, our dear uh, beloved uh, brother uh, Shodozono and Ronald uh, Polo Catalani for the introduction. And thanks to uh, our dear uh, board members, sisters and brothers, and special uh, thanks to our dear brother Hector Hanosa and uh, our moderators, uh, my beloved sister Linda Castillo and beloved sister uh, Melissa Bobadia. And thanks to each one of you, the panelists today, and we really appreciate it very much your presence with us. As uh, uh, Sho said, you know, this is one of five uh, series that we are trying to reclaim our narratives and find common grounds of our beloved community, you know, our dear sisters and brothers of immigrant and uh, refugees, and as well as the indigenous and mainstream America. We named it, you know, uh, the, the cultural road 
you know, the Silk Road cultural diplomacy for a reason at one time, 700 years of trade happened between East Asia and West Asia and then expanded itself to North Africa and the Southern part of Europe. You know, uh, uh, in memory of great sisters and brother, in memory of uh, Dean Nuhat Tolan, he was the founding Dean of the College of Urban Planning, an immigrant of Egyptian background, in memory of uh, Governor Atiya, an immigrant, you know, of Syrian background, in memory of uh, Gretchen Kafuri, Commissioner Kafuri, in memory of uh, African-American leader Charles Jordan, in memory of Commissioner uh, Nick Fish. These gentle giants, you know, uh, sisters and brothers that have passed away, they have left a legacy, a legacy of loving, a legacy of, uh, of respect, a legacy of healing and unifying. So we want to keep that momentum alive. And this is why we reclaim this, uh, this programs that my beloved sister, Linda Castillo has joined us in 2017. Today, the Muslim Education Trust and the New Portlander Foundation are collaborating, you know, to claim again these summits. We're going to have an Asian summit and we are going Asian and Asian Pacific Islanders. We're also going to have an African summit we're going to have also a European summit, as well as, you know, uh, an Native American. So this is the first of five summits that we want to claim. You know, the immigrant and refugees are always been left behind, you know. And this is why, you know, to reclaim and to define and, uh, and also mention to the public that we are all immigrants to this nation, except, you know, the indigenous people that welcomed us or those of us that came into slavery, not by choice. And they, you know, and they have integrated the resources to build a great and a beautiful, you know, you know, country from within. So reclaiming this narrative of healing and unifying through the immigrant eyes, through the refugees eyes, as well as to mainstream and the indigenous uh, reality. So I'm very thankful to each one of our board members I'm very thankful to each of the panelists today that you are healers and unifiers. You have been identified in your own context. And I'm very thankful as well to our board of advisors. We have, you know, Chaplain Andrea Cano. She's a chaplain or retired chaplain of Providence Health and Health Services. We have Sister, beloved Sister Jan Alfers, the president of Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon. We have Pastor Hennessy, pastor of of Vancouver Avenue Baptist Church. We have my beloved brother and retired, you know, council minister of United Church of Christ, Reverend Dr. Hector Lopez. We have our, my beloved brother, Alberto Morano, a Latino leader. We have also my beloved sister, Shelby Cardas, a former vice president of World Oregon. And we have also my beloved brother, Colini Fasuto from you know, a Pacific Islander leader and also an employee of Asian Family Services. Without further delay, I would like to introduce my beloved brother, Hector Honosa, a Latino leader and a great loving and caring and a healer in our beautiful public square. Hector. Gracias, hermano. I appreciate that. Um, just to get started uh, with uh, our, our event, if you can mute yourself, if you're not uh, uh, talking, that'd be a big help as we get better sound that way. Uh, I wanna welcome everybody uh, with the permission of the board of directors and, and our, our panelists who are uh, community leaders and elders in our community. Um, Olo and I are just going to enjoy each other's company for just a minute to talk about uh, some of the things that we're working on and, and have been working on community building. But before we get started, I, uh, Polo, I don't have on my screen uh, any of the elected officials or VIPs that, that have logged in. Um, do you, can you see them on yours and can we give them recognition? Yes. Uh, th thank you, Hector. I, I, I don't have a full screen either. <laughs> but, uh, what I do know, and folks, I do want to thank uh, elected officials for being here tonight, include State Representative Salman, Janine Salman, State Representative Susan McLean, State Representative Winsve Campos, uh, our mayor here in Hillsborough, Steve Calloway, 
uh, uh, Washington County Commission Chair Catherine Harrington, uh, brand new Washington County Commissioner Nafi Safai, uh, City Councilwoman Gina Roletto, or Royetto, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, City Councilwoman Nadia Hassan, and of course, uh, my younger brother's best bud in high school, Washington County Sheriff Pat Garrett. Hector? Wow, I'm sorry. I, I, I... We can hear you, Hector. Sorry about that. I was I made a face there because I had just received word that we have over 600 people who have logged in, uh, whether it's on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, so uh, great, great turnout. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. Um, thank you, Polo, for, for the uh, acknowledgement of our elected officials that have joined us. Uh, it's a testament to those folks who, who do care and, and, and care what's going on in our, our community. Um, it is a pleasure to, to share the stage with uh, Polo. We've been doing this for over 20 plus years, uh, doing battle. One of the ones that, that, that I'd love to share with all of you is uh, we have uh, been part of Oregon State University over the last 20 years, over 20 years, uh, representing the Board of Visitors uh, for Minority uh, Affairs, having to do with recruitment, placement, and retention of students, faculty, and staff. And we did that for the last 20 plus years, uh, Brother Polo. Uh, I recall John Burns, uh, Dr. Reeser, uh, Dr. White, and Dr. Ray, and we now have a new president whom uh, we haven't met yet, and I hope that we get an opportunity to meet him. But um, can you share a little bit about what our work was with uh, this beautiful rainbow coalition that, that we, Dr. Lee, Phyllis Lee, was actually under her leadership that put together, which I think is a great model uh, for all of us. Yeah, I think, um, in short, what we did was build community. And so, uh, Professor Dr. Phyllis Lee and uh, President John Burns and then President Rister afterwards uh, concluded that in order to have um, a sustainable student body uh, that was more than just the kind of young people and families who've been sending those young people to OSU, we needed to build community. So in order to do that, and Hector, I hate to tell you this, but it's been almost 30 years. You see- um, You had a full set of hair and I didn't have any gray hair. I know that for sure. <laughs> All right. And so the concept was, and let me say this, the product of it was, uh, for example, uh, Hector and, uh, and the La Raza uh, Student Association back then, uh, put together a uh, gathering for first year uh, students. And so this was basically our work. So the gathering was to have parents come and have them be reassured by President Risser and by all these tios and tias on campus, professors and health workers and the like, that we're going to watch over their kids. Moms were crying, dads were crying. Hector and his crew brought in a mariachi band. We ate until we barfed, we laughed until we cried. Those parents left in tears, not sad, but joy, that their children could now be trusted to President Risser and all these people who worked for him. Uh, likewise, uh, I was able to sell uh, because I'm a kind of a hybrid Pacific Islander, Asian, Latino, Muslim. Uh, families on the idea that you could buy your kids' education today back in 1980, 1990 dollars for when they're 18. And your kid may be a first or second grader, but you can pay these dollars now and secure their place then. And then the arc of your children's education is secured. Their wealth and their health in America is secured. This, as you know, sells with, with traditional people on every continent, you know, on our precious little planet. Uh, what's more, your children then will be expected to go to second grade, eighth grade, 12th grade university. That's just where they were going to go. If they then go to graduate school beyond that, terrific. Out of this mix, 
came all of those uh, Southeast Asian pharmacy people you see at Fred Meyer or C CVS, you know, or Walgreens. Uh, we, we practically took over this, the pharmacy school with Southeast Asian young women and young men. And then, of course, uh, computer engineering uh, and civil engineering. Native Americans got into forestry, um, fisheries, uh, and have made that, that leap of getting Oregon thinking about the health of rains and streams and salmon is the same thing as the health and wealth of human beings. It took those generations of young people uh, who took that wisdom from the elders and the ancestors and made it work a day uh, in, in Oregon uh, uh, public forestry and fishery and agricultural management agencies. So this is what we did. We built community in the way that's not that hard to do. Anybody here uh, can do that. If we just get out of these corporate models of marketing, this is just family. This is community building. Thank you, Hector. Try to unmute myself this time. Um, yeah, I think, Polo, you'd agree that, that Oregon State has partnered with us in our community, not just with Latinos, but a lot of our immigrant communities uh, for years. And we were lucky enough to be part of um, developing that relationship. Um, I, I recall when we were down there, um, we had quite a different uh, community, a uh, city. Today, the city of Corvallis, a uh, sanctuary, declared sanctuary. So has a university. Uh, so we're pretty proud of that. And, and, and it's uh, back then we were um, trying to convince administration that having Taco Bell in the lunchroom was not culturally specific. We needed arroz, frijoles, and tortillas for our, our students that we're sending down there. And that that was going to make mom and dad happy knowing that their children are being taken care of. So Polo and I spent a lot of time uh, convincing our staff and faculty that, and administrators that we needed to take the, the hierarchy of family as, uh, structure and values and, and, uh, and accommodate our, our, our young people. One story that I'd love to share with you, and I don't know, I think, Polo, I've shared it with you, and not to embarrass my sister Cecilia Giron on the line as one of our panelists, but I want to share a story about her real quick because it includes Portland State, it includes Intel, um, and, and how we can work together in the community to do community building. Uh, Cecilia, way back when, um, mentored a young man by the name of Octaviano Mercedes Cuevas, uh, who in turn mentored another young man who Miguel Cholula is currently a high school counselor at Forest Grove High School. Uh, and the three of them shared um, a common uh, after school program called Tech Wizards. Uh, under uh, Cecilia's uh, leadership, they incorporated that under uh, Oregon State Extension Service, which I am still a part of at the Metro as well as the state level. Uh, but they, they provided the support system for this after school program for Latinos. Um, called, again, Tech Wizards. Uh, Octaviano took over that project and uh, it's what I like to call STEM curriculum on steroids because the, the, the work and leadership that was coming out of there was amazing to the point where it actually received national recognition and is currently in 26 states across the nation. He imagine that born right here with these three people, well, four generations because Miguel Cholula continues to mentor new leaders that are currently at Portland Community College, Portland State, Oregon State, U of O, and they're spreading out. And so Cecilia, with you guys' leadership, uh, homegrown leadership right here, uh, we've been able to accomplish a lot, like I said, in 26 different states now. So thank you very much. Again, thank you, Oregon State University, for partnering with us in the community. That's the kind of partnering we need to uh, build communities, strong communities. Uh, and and just, just, you know, for you that are allies, open the door and we can come in and, and, and compete, I assure you. Uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm just so proud of them all. Uh, before we get started with what is supposed to be our project, instead of Polo and I yakking all day, uh, is to um, invite you to put your questions on the chat box uh, as we're going along. 
Um, I, before I turn it over to Melissa, I'd like for her to introduce herself. Just take two minutes to uh, state your name, the organization that you represent, and a brief description of what it is that you do. Your job title, of course. Um, and take about two minutes or so if you would do that, please. And then introduce the panelists if you would. Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here, for joining us uh, from your nice spot at home probably, or a great place with a computer. My name is Melissa Bobadilla. I am a local here. I've actually lived here now in the Washington County for about 20 years. I'm originally from Washington State. Um, I am a formerly a farm worker myself. My mother was an immigrant farm worker. I'm a first generation professional. I have my own law practice here in Washington County. I practice throughout the state of Oregon. I assist people and help people fight insurance companies most of the time or hold people responsible for harming others. Um, and now let me go ahead and introduce you to the panel that you, uh, we'll be having here that consists of six individuals. We'll have Cecilia Giron, we'll have Anthony Feliz, Ernesto Fonseca, Linda Castillo, David Martinez, and Maria Caballero Rubio. And so let's start with our panel so they can introduce themselves. Cecilia, can you please tell us about yourself, the organization that you represent, what you do, and the purpose of the organization? Hi, my name is Cecilia Giron, and I live here in Washington County. I've been in the nonprofit uh, world uh, for over 20 years. Come originally from the state of Oaxaca, Mexico, indigenous uh, Oaxaqueña, and my native language is Mixteco, um, and Spanish and English is my third language. And I am a mother of three children, and I also recently uh, was appointed in September as the LULAC uh, Oregon Director. And the organization that I represent is a, is a civil rights organization that has been in existence for over 90 plus years. And we uh, do focus on advocacy across the nation um, in, education, in, all, in education, housing, immigration, economic, um, and civil rights. Thank you, Cecilia. Anthony Veliz, can you please introduce yourself? Hola a todos, mi nombre es Anthony Veliz, and I am a, um, a lifelong Woodburn resident. My grandparents arrived here in 1946 as farm workers, and we are five generations now in Woodburn. Uh, our family has been committed to public service here in Woodburn. Uh, I'm a former school board member and city councilor, and I just served uh, my eighth year on the State Board of Education um, as the chair of the State Board the last two years. Um, I'm today, uh, today I'm representing the Oregon Latinx Leadership Network, which consists of over 100 community-based organizations that are led by or serve the Latinx community, uh, communities across the state of Oregon. And I started this um, collective movement in response to COVID-19 almost actually a year ago today. Um, I knew instinctively because of the history that I've had here in Woodburn um, that Latinos were gonna be one of the greatest, uh, greatest impacted uh, communities and it's played out exactly like um, I had predicted, and probably worse. Um, so I'm here today to represent that organization. And um, our two pillars are equitable investments in the Latinx community and equitable representation. Nothing about us with, um, without us. So thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Ernesto Fonseca, can you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. My name is Ernesto Fonseca, and I am the chief executive of Hacienda CDC. Hacienda CDC is a Latino-led um, housing and service organization. We're actually the largest uh, combined, you know, in terms of housing and, and, and services organization here in, in the state of Oregon. So I'm really proud that we're leading the charge, it's primarily in the Portland metro area, but now we have projects in Beaverton, Aloha, um, uh, Oregon City, Gresham, and obviously we're breaking ground in another one in, in Northeast Portland. In all, we're developing an additional 690 units as we speak, and we have another 400 units already on the ground. So we're providing housing to uh, about 1,500 uh, individuals right now, and we're going to be doubling that number or tripling that number uh, when you combine them all 
in the next couple of years. Uh, in addition to doing to providing housing, we also provide youth and family services, economic opportunity, and a small business development across the, the state. We're actually moving into Hermiston now, which I'm really, really proud that we're moving to where our communities are located. One of the changes that I have made since I arrived to um, Hacienda is that uh, Hacienda should no longer be where it was born. You know, we should go where the communities that need our services, where our people are located. That's where we need to be. So we're going to be moving in. Uh, we are already in Hillsborough. We're already in Oregon City. We are already partnering with some organizations in the Hermiston, Jumatilla County area. So expect to see us there a little bit more in the coming uh, months and years. And um, I've been doing community development for about 15 years plus. I have a PhD in uh, public health uh, and uh, environmental planning design, which is pretty exciting because everything that I learned in school has to some extent a relationship to what I'm doing right now. Uh, Oregon has taught me a lot of things, especially Miss Linda right here, even though we don't talk a lot, but uh, Linda uh, and I, you know, we're part of UNIDO, the UNIDOS class, and many of you have been my mentors even without you knowing it. So I appreciate the opportunity to let me be who I am and learning, you know, as I move forward in this state uh, of Oregon. I've been here only for four years, this coming April 5th. So I'm excited to be part of this group. Thank you all. Welcome, Ernesto. Linda Castillo, can you please introduce yourself? Uh, buenas tardes, my name is Linda Castillo and thank you so much uh, for inviting me to join all these wonderful panelists who I admire greatly, who've done tremendous work here in Oregon and in lots of other places. Uh, my family is from Michoacan and Zacatecas and on my mother's side from Zacatecas, crossing back and forth across the border in the mid 1800s and then eventually settling uh, into uh, the Middle Valley in California as farm workers. My dad came over as a Bracero in the Bracero program, uh, and that's where my parents eventually met. Uh, living in Northern California was uh, much more diverse than here in Oregon when I was uh, brought with <laughs> my, my then husband at that time to come to Oregon and always wondered where the caritas and los ojos, the color, and you know, so it was always a very different experience. You know, it was a little brown, brown you know, shiny eyes. But in this period of time that I've been here, um, oh, well over 30 years, I've raised twin daughters who are now 32 and um, had the, the, the wonderful uh, opportunity to work in government, city, county, state, and also in a variety of nonprofit organizations. I'm here representing uh, the State of Oregon Commission on Hispanic Affairs uh, to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing and political leadership. I'm currently the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager over at Berco, and um, I'll leave it at that. Gracias. David Martinez, can you introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I'm David Martinez, he, him, and his. Uh, I'm the Deputy Director of Internal Operations at Latino Network, and I'm actually uh, right at this moment in my parents' kitchen in Eastern Oregon, Ontario, Oregon. So I'm born and raised in uh, Eastern Oregon. My dad is from Dr. Arroyo, Nuevo León, Mexico, and my mom is from McAllen, Far, Texas, and there were farm workers that would travel through California, uh, Washington and Oregon and finally met at a labor camp in Eastern Oregon where all of us were born and raised. I share that because uh, my mission in life has been about my community and remembering where I come from and knowing that that's where my strength and uh, my, uh, I, I guess my mission in life uh, comes from. Um, at Latino Network, uh, we are a community-based organization. Uh, we work in the Tri-County area, uh, Multnomah County, Washington County, uh, Multnomah County, Clackamas, Clackamas County, I forgot. Um, we actually started as an advocacy organization in the late 90s, where we were a convener. We brought together Latino leaders to talk about the issues and to advocate for additional resources for our community. It then evolved into a uh, direct service organization where we now have programs not only in advocacy, but also early childhood, school-based programs, Sun schools, 
family stability programs, and youth violence and prevention programs. And so our, our mission at Latino Network is to uh, work with community. We believe our Latino community is, um, is where it should drive the agenda. And so the programs and services that we do are in partnership and are community led. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here as part of this panelist and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, David. And now let's hear from Maria Caballero Rubio. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Maria Caballero Rubio. Um, I am honored to be here as part of the panel as well. Um, I currently am the executive director at Centro Cultural in Washington County. Um, I'm also the president of the Human Rights Council in Washington County over the past Four years, we have been very active in keeping alive the Declaration of uh, Human Rights, the international one, and reminding people that it still exists and it applies to us here in the United States as well. Um, I am a founding member of the Latino Policy Council, which is part of Centro Cultural's advocacy um, arm. And uh, we formed this organization because we realized that we needed to do more than just provide services to our community. We need to create systems change. And in order to create systems change, you need to uh, build the capacity of our community leading and also participating in decision making. So we are working uh, with the local governments in Washington County to look at the policies uh, in place and how they impact our communities. Um, and those that need uh, changes, then we advocate for those. Um, I'm also a member of the Greater Portland Economic Development District, um, the treasurer of that uh, group. We've been doing a lot of work in planning the economic development plan for the next five years. And I'll be talking a little bit, just a little bit more about that, um, our goals um, later on. Uh, currently, I'm also on the Criminal Justice Reform and Police Accountability Committee of the Racial Justice Council, um, the Governor's Council. Um, my experience, my professional life has been in criminal justice and policing for the past 30 years. I have worked at all levels, um, city, uh, county, state, and in Washington, D.C., um, uh, for the Department of Justice in, and most of my career has actually been involved in trying to change policing. So I have a lot to say about that, but this is not the, the venue for that. But anyway, um, thank you so much. I also, as a lot of folks on the panel, um, am, have been a migrant farm worker for most of my life until um, I came to Oregon in 1969 and we set my family settled here from California and started our lives here. So. Um, it's uh, an honor again to be here and thank you so much. Thank you to all of you from the panel. As you can see, we have a great panel here that's gonna be able to see, share some great information. We have a few questions that we'll be asking the panel. We'll start, we have six questions specifically. We will be asking the questions individually to each of the individual to each of the panelists and giving the opportunity for the other panelists to go ahead and chime in. We're going to hold off two questions to the very end. At the very end, we will have some time to be able to ask some questions to all these panelists. So let's get started here. Let's start with Ernesto. Can you here's your question? What does affordable housing look like in the Latino communities? Oh, that's a big question, uh, Melissa, uh, especially in the state of Oregon. The state of Oregon is a really, really, it's becoming a very diverse community. You know, many of the communities, as you know better than I do, uh, in, in the state of Oregon, go back to the 1920s with the first immigrants coming to this uh, state. Keep in mind that most of my experience, you know, is from the Southwest. So it's a very rich and diverse and populous Latino community. Uh, and Latinx community in that area. When I came to the Northwest, I started learning quickly, you know, about some of the, at least academically, some of the conditions in terms of housing for Latinos. I had to do that very quickly uh, academically, simply because I couldn't really have the experience that many of you already had, either by being born here or your families being born here. But initially, most of the communities of, of Latinos were farm workers, you know, they were coming and moving to the state of Oregon, then coming out and moving to the next field and other states in many occasions. Today, um, 
the next generations and the younger generations have changed dramatically and they are changing dramatically the Latino landscape of uh, Oregon. That means that many Latinos are moving to the uh, to the Portland metro area. When I say the Portland metro area, I'm talking, you know, all the way from Hillsborough through uh, Troutdale, uh, Tigard, and Tualatin, and Beaverton, and all of these areas, not just in Portland. In fact, you know, Portland Latino population is going down. With that small framework, you know, we have some strong, you know, Latino populations in the Woodburn area, Medford, and Central Oregon, Western Oregon, Eastern Oregon. There are very large communities of Latinos that continue to brew and to grow and to mature in those communities. When I say mature, I mean, you know, more and more generations, you know, keep building up uh, and so on and so forth. All of these conditions in terms of education, income, and their ability to uh, move and speak English and to move from place to place and the age of these individuals really shapes the type of housing and the housing conditions that many of these families and individuals, including the younger uh, couples and individuals have. Right now, uh, we can see significant increases in the city of Gresham, as well as the Beaverton um, Hillsborough area. And I want to stress that even though Beaverton, I mean, Hillsborough is very well known for being a Latino, largely Latino community, even though it continues to be mostly uh, white in terms of statistics, but Beaverton, it's a community that is growing tremendously. It's one of the most diverse cities in, in the state after North East Portland. North East Portland sadly is becoming less diverse as continues to get gentrified by more and more development. But some of the good news about these like this, this uh, um, uh, trends that we are experiencing, experiencing as Latinos and Latinos continue to see that the need or the desire to have a house that you own, that is a very strong tradition or cultural factor, however you want to see it, something that is taught, that is being given and is being told to us day after day since we're little, we need to buy it at nuestra casa, nuestra casita, whatever that is, whatever message you get home is you need to own your house. So since 2017, Latinos having, since 2007 up until 2020, Latinos increased home ownership uh, by 18%. Unfortunately, some of our brothers and sisters in the African-American community haven't seen th that growth. In fact, they are seeing decreased rates in homeownership, but for Latinos, it's looking good. Now, many people may question, you know, how can Latinos, especially with lower incomes, can make this happen? Well, you know, as, as things go, you know, for us Latinos, the family, it's a big factor in the success or our failure, you know, altogether. So many of us, you know, bundle together, our children, ourselves, our parents, we co-sign a loan and then we buy a house. Uh, so homeownership continues to increase with the Latino community. Just last year alone, Hacienda by itself, you know, counsel over 300 people to, for homeownership. Out of those 300 people, about 30 people buy their houses. So 10% of the people that we counsel purchase a new home as opposed to the entire state of Oregon where other communities, you know, are increasing their homeownership by 10 to 15, 18, 18 houses that are being purchased by the African-American community, for example. So um, the housing conditions and the housing uh, types of Latinos for beginners, you know, it's townhouses to begin with in urban, uh, in urban areas and single family homes in um, more rural, rural or uh, cities that are far away from, from the central area of, of Metro, which is Portland, Beaverton, and, and Gresham. So the further out that you go, the more housing ownership that you will see owned by Latinos in single family homes. When you come to the city, the more townhomes and apartment complexes, duplexes, condos that you will see for Latinos. So there are some really good indicators on the Latino, uh, on the Latino home ownership uh, trend. That doesn't mean that we should sit around and, and, and say, you know, we're victorious, you know, we're doing so well. There is still a lot of work to do. About 35% of Latinos own their houses currently versus, you know, the other 65% that still need to buy a house, still need to get up there, still need to, you know, build that little piece of the American dream. So um, 
we continue to do our, our, our part here in, in, in the state of Oregon. Uh, home ownership in other states, especially in the Southwest, is a little stronger than what it is here in Oregon. But then again, you know, those Latino communities are older. They have had a lot more time to build a little bit of wealth and to build the numbers. Those numbers are something that I continue to watch day after day. And I'm really, really excited to see that our Latino community continues to, to be stronger and stronger and stronger. We are not as vocal as other communities are sometimes, but I, I, I can assure you that we are quiet, but move strongly into that area of homeownership and asset building. So um, some good news there. Uh, but a lot of work is still that we need to do in many, many areas, especially on education and healthcare. Those are two areas where we are lacking strongly. Uh, education is a really expensive enterprise. And one of the good things, and also one of the burdens that is uh, that comes with being a Latino member uh, of a family, is that when somebody in our families is something beautiful that I see, but it's also a lot of work, somebody has issues, we pitch in, we help, but also, you know, that brings a lot of limitations sometimes for us to be able to uh, pursue our own dreams, to pursue our own careers, to do whatever we need to do. So it is a really delicate balance. You know, my daughter just finished, uh, she's 15, just finished a play that is called Not Going Anywhere. And she was referring to me and other stories that um, I, I'm going to be done, actor uh, about, you know, what families uh, experience. And and the issue is that at the end of the day, we need to make a decision as to where we want to go. I will tell you that story later. Hector was giving the sign that I crossed my time. So thank you everyone uh, for listening. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Ernesto. Cecilia, I'd like to present to you the next question. What are some of the top social justice issues in the Latino community as of today? Um, that's a, a big question, uh, Melissa, in us. And I will start by saying that across the board, our Latino community continues to lack of representation, um, particularly with uh, leaders, uh, Latino leaders in positions where decisions are being made and adequate resources are not allocated to the Latino community and our indigenous communities of color. We come from different um, backgrounds, different sectors, different um, countries. The Latino community is very diverse, yet we continue to see that they put us in this in, in one bucket or one box. We come from um, from different countries of Latin America and we come from different levels of education, different levels of, of income, different levels of languages, cultures. So we are very diverse. And one of the, the, the issues that, that, that we continue to see and, and I continue to see across the state is healthcare, adequate healthcare and accessible quality healthcare for our Latino indigenous communities. Um, education, that's another big one. Uh, we still uh, not uh, closing that achievement gap, higher education, but it's not just higher education. We continue to see the disparity, disparities and not investing into our early child education all the way to um, college or university. And uh, we have a very low percentage of graduation for our Latino uh, youth and our Latin, Latino children graduating from high school. Uh, immigration, you know, we have a system that is broken. We have families that are in fear. Every day they live in fear and they're vulnerable communities and we need to stop that. We need an inclusive system of, of, of immigration system throughout the country. Also housing, as Ernesto mentioned, affordable housing and more accessible home ownership opportunities for working families and, and also uh, low income families. It is critical and important. We saw that um, and we continue to see that not only in, in one county, but throughout the state, particularly in Southern Oregon where the fires hit really hard, particularly our Latino vulnerable community. Uh, more than 2000 homes were destroyed. And these are mobile homes where our communities were also living. And now they're, they're living in hotels, they're living in um, Arby's. And, and our children uh, continue to, to leave those inequities. Um, 
So affordable housing is another one. Economic disparities. We see that there's not access to capital, funding, uh, funding to support our small businesses. Latinos uh, are rapidly growing in small businesses, but yeah, there's fear of losing your, your business, particularly in this pandemic. Um, so we, 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 we want to make sure that our, our small businesses are being supported during the pandemic and also to grow their businesses and stay in a and, and stay um, alive and not close, particularly with, with this pandemic. And this, you know, we continue to also see discrimination and racism. We don't talk about that, but we do continue to see that. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, there's, these are just some of social justice issues that our community are facing every day. And I hope that by having these type of conversations and talking to our, our communities and also our uh, constituencies and also our people that we elect, that we wanna see a diverse uh, representation in positions of power. We wanna see representation that look like us in our local um, communities, in our, in our county and in our state. That is critical and important in order for us to bring those resources uh, to our Latino community across the board. And we need to support more people, Latino, uh, Latinos or Latinx communities uh, and, and, and work on the workforce development. We need more resources to uh, build up this community that we have seen um, a lot of inequities has happened. And this is not just now, this has been happening for generations and generations. And it is uh, very difficult to, to close the achievement gap on education when you don't have housing, when you don't have uh, access to capital. So everything is interconnected. We cannot just uh, focus on one area and leave the other. So everything, it is interconnected. So we need to make sure that we uh, invest into uh, into all of these areas. Thank you, Cecilia. Let's add on to that. Let's see, Maria. I have the following question for you: How can we create a lev a level playing field towards social economic equality here for Latinos? Yes, thank you. And I do appreciate um, Cecilia's words of everything being interconnected. Um, housing, economic development, um, health, education, all of that is, is together. Um, so uh, social um, and economic mobility in the United States refers to the upward or downward movement of Americans from one level uh, to another. And those changes happen through uh, job changes, inheritance, marriage, connections, tax changes um, uh, and hard work. And so hard work is what Latinos are known for. And in particular, those of us that came, my, my parents are from, were from Mexico and they came over through the Bracero program back in the forties during the war. And um, we, we work very hard. We have always worked very hard. I listened to my, um, my friends and my acquaintances when we get together, we all talk about what our parents left us. And what we talk about most is they left us with the good, a good work ethic. And so we have worked very hard, but unfortunately those of us that came from, um, from poverty, and that's why my parents came to the United States uh, seeking a better life. Um, it's been very hard to move up on the, uh, economic uh, uh, economic mo mobility matrix, and mainly because of different um, reasons that are political, that are um, racist, that are that have been in place for a long time, and maybe not intentionally, but they have held back Latinos and other communities of color in particular. Um, so for me, um, I think that the way that we level that playing field is to make sure that we educate ourselves and we become aware, we hope, and, and get involved at the different levels of decision making. And so I'm really proud of all of the Latinos that have run for office and that are sitting at the decision making tables now. The, um, 
the our African Americans as well. I think it's time, and I think that we we will get there eventually. Uh, we have a long way to go, as somebody on the panel mentioned, that we're not there yet. But in terms of uh, what we need to do to level that playing field is that we need to do wealth building for our community. For too long, we have been have we've worked very hard. We try to advance, but we're not given loans. We're not approved for how, buying a home. Uh, we end up with bad credit. Uh, Num uh, number because of not being able to pay bills and those kinds of things. So it becomes a cycle almost to the point of people just giving up. Um, and so I think that what we need to do as a community is to really work on what Ernesto said earlier, um, home ownership, which really is a, a factor in wealth building. We need to work and focus on really getting folks trained into good jobs through the trades. Uh, not everybody can go to college. Not everybody wants to go to a four-year university, but they are hard workers. And I think that we need to uh, really focus on getting them those opportunities. As you probably know, that that also has been an area where uh, we haven't had much access because it's who you know and who refers you, et cetera. Um, the last thing is uh, income security, really working with folks uh, to think about the future uh, to think about investments and in retirements. My, fam my parents never had a checking account or a savings account. Everything that we earned in one day, we spent that day. There were 11 of us siblings and my two parents and we were out in the fields. So at the end of the day, whoever needed shoes that day, there goes the money. So we, we don't come from a lot of you know, financial literacy, financial even thinking about that. We live for the day. So I think that um, in order to uh, level the playing field, we really need to focus on that. And I think that that's what we're beginning to do as a Latino community. Thank you, Maria. Um, yes, I, I remember those times when I moved to Oregon, it was all about your, who you know, networking. And most of us don't know what networking means or what it is. You're taught by others that are willing to take the time to teach you, to take you under their wing, You're right? Especially Oregon is, is a very tight community in that. Uh, let's build up on about education here. David, I have a question for you. What are some of the barriers towards obtaining an education for Latinos? As you've seen, education is becoming really cost prohibited for many of us. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. And it's a very big one. And I think a lot of what um, I would share is um, something that's been referenced in, in, the, in the answers before. Um, you know, the challenges or the barriers that exist are ones that um, are not new. A lot of what we see in education, we've seen from generations, which is uh, having access and having a relationship and really recognizing the role that family plays in a young person's um, educational journey. So I'm right now in Ontario, Oregon, Eastern Oregon, and the school system here looks very different than the school system in Portland Public Schools, for example. And so a lot of times when, when we think of education in the state of Oregon, we, I, I feel and, and have seen, we don't recognize what it looks like in a rural setting versus an urban setting, what it looks like in, in Southern Oregon um, versus what it looks like in Northeast Oregon. Um, I say that because when we look at educational success and when we look at barriers, we need to be thinking about the environment and what's accessible and available for the students and families. One of the things that a Latino network that we, we build on is the strength of the community. One of the biggest strengths is familia. So when familia can be connected to the school system where there's a role or, and when they're welcome, then a student is more likely to be successful. If there is a program, we have one of our early childhood programs that starts very early, zero, zero, to, zero to five year olds. Um, juntos, it's our, um, it is our, early, it's our Crescendo Juntos program, which is basically preparing uh, parents to be advocates for their students when they're entering the school system. So it's again, recognizing that the role of the family, the role of the parent is critical from the very early stages when you're just entering uh, the school system. And then as you go through the school system. So our, our other programs that we have Latino Network 
um, that work specifically with like the middle school, seventh and eighth grade uh, cohorts is conexiones. And that literally translates to connections. So building connections within the school system for that young, the young student and also for their family. And then we go on to um, our early Escalera program, which is working with ninth and 10th graders. And then our, our Escalera program, which is 11th and 12th graders. All of these efforts, all of these programs are partnerships with the school districts and our investments that are being made, um, not only in the young person, but in the, in the family. So when we think of educational access and success for our Latino students, it's really critical that we're looking at not just that person that sits in front of you, but it's that extended family, because that support system that does exist, that a lot of times for whatever, for different factors, um, barriers are put in place, whether it's language, whether it's assumptions of whether or not support is there, or, or whether it is just a, again, a new environment for that person, for that young, for that student and that family, all of that will, will prevent or, or make, will provide challenges uh, for that person to persist. The other piece of it, it's not just K through 12, it is post-secondary. And as, as, as Maria mentioned, when we think of post-secondary, it is not just a uh, four-year university. It's two-year, four-year, private, public. It's technical and trades. It's a whole breadth of what a young person's interests, where they see themselves being successful, and also where they're being encouraged. So I think the other aspect of educational attainment and educational success for Latino students is really believing and knowing that wherever that young person's dream or wherever they um, um, their interests lie, it, it's just being able to nurture that and to find that connection, whether it's a K through 12 system or whether it's in the post-secondary system. I do wanna just stop there and I wanna really give Anthony Veliz a chance to talk specifically um, around some of the data that he knows within the Board of Education, because I know that he's stepping down from that role, but I, but I, I wanna share my time with him. Thank you. I also want to add there, if you can also touch a little bit more also on college education, I understand also, for example, when I first went to college, and it's been a few years too, but I was a first generation college student, I can tell you there that the likelihood of failure for first generation college students is very high. And there needs to be some, bear, there needs to be some resources there at the post-secondary education level to, to be able to help and assist those individuals. I was fortunate enough, I was able to find some professors and after I transferred to another university, because then it becomes much, much, un becomes much like unattainable to even become a professional, get a professional degree. So I think that's even another part where we need to remember and hopefully there's more resources even at that college level that are getting addressed to make sure that we don't lose those students, our first generations. You, you touched on a very good point, David, right now. From where you're at right now, the education system right there is very different from someone all the way coming, let's say, to University of Oregon, to Portland State. It's like night and day all of a sudden to be put into, in that environment. So we need some of those resources. Let's hear yeah. from Anthony. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I was just going to interject. I think one of the things at the public institutions, for example, there are programs, resources, but a lot of it is that connection. A lot of it is really having that young person understand and really be able to connect with whatever that student center, whatever that student club, whatever that student resource is. So Melissa, I agree, those resources are so critical. And then part of that is, is helping to navigate for that student and for that family. And so now I'll turn it over to Anthony. Thank you, I'll just make it quick. Um, you know, I just wanna let everybody know that the Latinx community the students K-12 make up over 25% of the student population. That's about 125,000 plus students and growing. We are one in four uh, births in, the, in, in, um, in Oregon. So if you see the trend is coming, it's, that wave is getting bigger and bigger. Um, you know, even though uh, there has been a lot of um, more people are succeeding, more Latinx students are succeeding, but not as a percentage, right? It's, our population is growing, but the percentage of people that are graduating, having more success and moving on to career technical is, is, is still a challenge. We're not there yet. Um, you know, the population exploded, right, in the 80s and 90s. And since then, we haven't been able to catch up. The Latinx community has evolved, right? When we first, when, we, when the Latino, when I was growing up, they were mainly 
Chicanos, Mexican Americans, people were actually more U.S. born, and then that changed, and now a lot of um, of newcomers and immigrants, and which is great, right? But it's, it created another set of challenges for the case, for the system. But I think that you know, um, it's people like us and people. Uh, These conversations are what's going to make the difference. Um, you know, we do have a, a crisis. We don't have enough. Uh, teachers in our classrooms that look like students and of all students of color. And I think that's that's really a serious issue um, in the K-12 system because we have to have people that look like 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 the students, right? That that are, are, are um, that have that uh, cultural uh, DNA with built in so they can relate to the students, right? Not to say that other people can't, but I but it's definitely um, something that's a positive added value to the students. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, but yes, we do have a lot. I, I think I would just my last shout out for the student, the Latinx Student Success Act that's coming up. And that's um, an opportunity to really focus on the students. Well, Anthony, since I have you on here, let, let me present you with a question here. Let's add on to that. What are some of the inequalities in the healthcare for Latinos? Let's pivot. So thank you for that question. And um, I have a really interesting perspective on this. My mom was the very first employee of Salud Medical Clinic, which is the very first farm worker clinic in Oregon. And so I actually was there when, when we were moving desks. And um, you know what? The people have changed. The facilities have gotten nicer today. But the same issue issues stand. There is deep inequity in healthcare, and um, I think I'll just run, um, kind of come at it in today's term. What does that mean? Well, from I started the Oregon Latinx Leadership Network, it was because of the COVID nineteen, and one of the things that I think that, um, that I've seen the most that has impacted our community is information. Information is power, right? And we haven't had very much information in a timely way. This is moving really fast, and when it comes to the Latino community and things being translate, um, translated or even just communicated in Spanish or other indigenous languages like Mixteco, Zapoteco, Zapoteco or Mom, the system is failing us. And because this is moving so fast, I mean, our, our community traditionally is consistently on the back of the line. In fact, they don't even know there's a line to get into most of the time. So that's really hurting everything in this modern era of pandemic is the digital divide. Everything went to registration even the vaccine that we talk about it today you have to go online to register guess what we don't have any computers we don't have internet access we don't even have an email and that's that's really hurting our community and that's being played out um i think we're like uh, consistently we were like 30 to 40 percent of all deaths and, and um covid cases in fact the, the people if you go to a, a, a you today you'll see latinos that are 30 to 40 year old men are, are that's filling up those uh, those places of the ICUs and are actually dying from COVID-19. And it's really sad. So I think, you know, there's a modern, um, modern day, um, you know, disparity, right? And those are the two. Um, our farm workers, obviously, uh, since we opened up the clinic and today, they are, um, you know, and the indigenous Mesoamericans that work in that, in that and the Mexicans and Latinos that work in that field, you know, we're called, um, you know, essential workers, but we're treated like disposable workers. And I can, I can prove that because I have videos and photos of our Latino community working in the worst air quality in the world in Southern Oregon when we had those fires. And I know Cecilia um, was part, you know, knows that really well because we worked together on this. And that's, that's tragic, right? And, you, and we don't even know what the healthcare is, um, what the, what's gonna happen, right? With all of breathing in all that uh, toxic uh, smoke. Um, I think another big, I think I'll just kind of close with this is that, you know, there has not been an equitable investment in healthcare when it comes to Latinx community. And there's not enough representation, again, doctors, nurses, health professionals. Um, those, those two factors right there will always um, impact our Latinx community. Um, they'll have definitely um, in negative impacts on health outcomes. And so I think, you know, we need equity within equity because we are by far the largest ethnic group in Oregon. Um, we're the youngest, we're the fastest growing, and um, you know, we're 13%. Uh, there's over 500,000 Latinx um, individuals, over 100,000 undocumented. By, 30, by 2030, we'll probably be at 800,000 to a million Latinos in, in, um, in um, Oregon. So with that, I know that another big issue is healthcare, and I wanna turn this over to Linda because I know that her, um, the Oregon Commission on Hispanic Affairs did an outstanding job in, in a report. So I'd like to just turn over um, my time to Linda to talk about that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, you're so right. Uh, you know, COVID and, and all these things really kind of uplifted the incredible amount of um, disparities and vulnerabilities in our healthcare system. It just doesn't exist for our community in the way that it should. Um, and so along with that, with uh, COVID and, uh, you know, a variety of other uh, health uh, risks for our community. One of the largest ones that's been ongoing and enduring and continuing to get worse is around the area of mental health. Now our communities, many of our communities of color have a, a lot of stigma around mental health, but that is no excuse for us not to have a, a you know, deep and uh, well-represented mental health system that serves us, not only with mainstream types of mental health of counseling, psychiatrists, psychologists, but also decolonized kinds of mental health with traditional healers, community health workers, you know, all those kinds of things that our community needs, uh, you know, herbal treatments, all of those things. And um, the Oregon Commission of Hispanic Affairs for the last three years, that has been uh, the main priority area that we've been working on, is really doing a lot of uh, communication with our community around mental health and their needs, doing a lot of research. Uh, we had four interns who came and looked at the data uh, at the state of Oregon. One in particular who looked at over 30,000 bits of uh, data sets uh, for a 30 year period of uh, data on Latino mental health that had never ever been looked at before. So it was the first time that it was ever reviewed. And in that she compiled some data uh, around uh, our healthcare usage and um, how long we stayed in services, where we received services, what kind of services. We had another intern who did interviews around the state with various providers regarding the challenges of providing services. The ones that are the most poignant are the folks that are in the rural uh, Eastern parts of Oregon, where we have folks who are one therapist to maybe you know, 250 to 1,000 uh, participants who can uh, access their services, but they're not able to because it's just one person. Um, so a variety of things that we did discover and from that, we also were able to look at best practices, uh, talk with our community about what would be best in our system, what we'd like to see, and then also be able to make some specific uh, uh, policy recommendations that were really based on the community um, uh, you know, lived experience and their recommendations as well. And from that came five bills that when we get to the point when I can talk about uh, a little bit about uh, our political movement, I can share just what those bills are. But it's it's been a huge, a huge challenge for our community. We don't have enough providers. We don't have enough of the types of services that our community needs. And particularly with these wildfires, I mean, you know, I'm so glad Orlean went out there and they took mental health providers, but those folks are in, in shock. You know, they've lost their homes, they've lost their community, they've lost their livelihood. Um, and this is just unacceptable that we would continue to have this kind of condition for our community. So we have those individuals, we have uh, essential workers, which are of course farm workers, but we don't also talk about the sanitation, the COVID sanitation folks. These are our gente who are going out there cleaning up all the offices and doing all those things. And they are an incredible risk as well. And I'll leave it at that. Linda, let's, um, thank you for adding on to that. And since I have you now on the uh, speaking, to, let's address the following question then. You were, I think you were kind of pivoting on it. How can the Latinos, um, and I think it's just important, it's perfect wrapping right there. How can Latinos obtain political influence, which is obviously very important given all these issues that are that we all have and they haven't been solved. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's it's huge. I mean, I mean, there's no question we don't have sufficient representation nationally or in the state of Oregon. Um, you know, we're just we don't have enough elected folks, appointed folks, folks who are in volunteer public service uh, positions. And according to the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, um, you know, we had uh, the best year in 2020 where we had our community run in about uh, 36 uh uh, states and top offices. So that was great. I think we were very motivated by the uh, recent past administration to really become much more involved and emboldened in the work. But still, there's only about 75,000 folks who are in elected office, which is really just 10%, uh, actually just fewer than that. Um, it's, a, you know, it's, it's way lower than that. It's increased 10% over the years. But uh, of that, uh, women are only about 25 hundred of those elected positions. Um, and so we just have about, you know, 36% of that overall in the whole state and the whole, uh, rather in the whole nation. 
And most of the folks who are in those positions are in positions of municipal offices uh, for education, school boards. And of course, the least numbers are at the highest level of the US Senate and the House of Representatives. And the states that have the greatest momentum in this particular area is of course, California, Texas, um, New Mexico and Arizona. Here in Oregon, according to government track and the Oregon Legislative Association and Oregon School Board and the League of Oregon Cities, uh, we only at our level represent 3% of elected office holders. Um, again, we saw a, a pretty in amazing increase in these last couple of years of folks running for office, but the proportional representation should be at least 9%. Um, but we're shaking it up. I mean, we're seeing a lot of changes in small towns in Springfield and in Bend. You know, we're seeing an incredible increase of folks in school boards in city councils and city commissions. And, you know, again, congratulations to uh, Carmen Rubio, who is our first commissioner, Latina commissioner in the city of Portland. Um, and, you know, we almost had a Latino mayor in the city of Gresham. So, I mean, things are starting to percolate and move much more, but it's still not the place that we'd like to see. So did I hear you correctly? You say that right now, presently, Latinos overall in the state of Oregon only hold 3% of the upper elected positions. Yeah, yeah, it's very low. Well, low. I mean, there's a lot of folks who are in um, volunteer positions, you know, running in school boards and various things, but not in the positions where that are more elevated in, in political influence. What can we do to help elevate and get more people to be in those type of positions? Yeah, can I share a, a, a PowerPoint? Yeah, yes. just real quick, because it will have some specific information. It'll be a lot quicker to to share than, than otherwise. Let me know. Yes, let me have our host let you be a co-host. Hector, can you allow can you allow co-hosting, please? It. Yeah, I'm working on it. Yeah, I don't have access to it either. We got it. She should be able to share. Thank you. Okay. you should be able to do that now, Linda. No. Okay, great. Great. Let's see. Oops. That's not what I want to share. So let me see here. So um, what I just wanted to share was um, just this bit of information that I think is really helpful. Of course, our most uh, famous icon, Dolores Huerta. And so these are just the various opportunities for leadership. I think, you know, for us to really think in the zone of where we can start to um, kind of scaffold our leadership. I think we really need to think about leadership development and public service training. So these are a variety of places where folks can go. Emerge is a candidate training for women, uh, democratic women. And it's pretty multicultural, multi-ethnic in terms of, you know, predominantly white women, of course, but we are seeing a greater amount of Latinas who are training to, to run for office. Latino Network, of course, has Unidos en la Academia de Líderes, which is a really wonderful uh, couple of leadership programs, grassroots and grass tops. And folks are involved in a variety of activities and you know, really developing their leadership. There's, of course, Capaces, which is in Woodburn, and the Oregon Latino Agenda for Action. Uh, and we um, launched the Latinos in Public Service and uh, had a time there to work uh, with Victory, um, Latino Victory, which was founded by Eva Ligoria, and uh, really working on targeting uh, Latino voters and training folks to be prepared to run for office. And then of course, Naleo, which is the National Association, and they work also to uh, train folks and provide information. And then of course, Latino Victory Project, which is a wonderful organization that really prepares folks. The previous um, president of uh, Latino Victory, uh, Cristobal Alex is now uh, the Deputy Secretary in the Biden uh, administration. So folks have started to, you know, populate those uh, positions in, in higher levels of political um, uh, action. Another piece is certainly the service provision to start to be involved in a variety of community activities, community volunteering and government. 
and a variety of other um, opportunities such as nonprofits. And then we have some wonderful community organizing opportunities to Ruin, to Lulac, to Vos, to Causa, to Picun, and there are many, many more. And then folks can also consider public service and you know, running for an elected office school board or participating in committees or commissions and boards. And so here I have um, uh, uh, the OregonGov.gov um, pages for folks to apply for commissions and boards. So there are hundreds and hundreds of commissions and boards in uh, the state of Oregon. And folks might think, you know, why is that of interest? I think the more that our community is involved in these particular areas, the more we can help shape um, the rules around these particular things. The one area I think about is for mental health, for the certification boards, it is extremely challenging for our community to get licensed and certified. And so if we don't have our community a voice around that table, that's really gonna be, continue to be a barrier and a difficulty. The other two opportunities are through the uh, Oregon Commissions. You know, I am the chair of the Oregon Commission on Hispanic Affairs, but we also have a commission of Asian Pacific Islander for a black commission, a commission for women. And then the recently developed Racial Justice Council, which allows the opportunity for folks to serve for at least a year in a variety of areas. And this is under uh, Govern Governor Brown. And they have a lot of opportunity to work with us to help shave shape public policy at the state level. Um, and this is a little bit what I was talking about in terms of just um, the bills we were able to push through recently. Um, one of the areas was certainly around uh, the mental health provider shortage that we have. And so we wanted to use some of the funds that are available around professional shortage um, uh, concerns and uh, really begin to focus on mental health providers. So that's one bill. Another bill by Representative Bynum has at least 14 or so different areas around mental health um, that, that's spectacular. And we're really pushing that one as well. And then of course the needs assessment for mental health providers, a curriculum that starts to move folks from um, high school through um, secondary education to really create a pipeline for them to become more involved in mental health services and then a statewide coordinated plan around mental health in the schools. And then the last one, the trauma-informed mental health pilot. Uh, last year, there was a very successful pilot in a couple of high schools. And what we found, the actual target was to increase um, the, the hours of seat time that folks would have, that students would have in school. The wonderful uh, outcome of that was not only did they increase graduation, but we had a number of students who also were able to access mental health services and help them to be much more present at school and much more successful. So if folks are ever interested in any of these bills or going to testify, I've also included the Oregon Legislative Information System, which is really helpful, very easy to navigate. You just put in the bill you're interested in or the topic you're interested in and you'll get that information. And then the last thing I really wanna be working on is creating, um, uh, you know, a Black, Indigenous, People of Color, Immigrant, Refugee, Mental Health Directory so that folks can access this information. Right now, it is so scattered and so difficult for folks to find a provider. They may go to their insurance provider and not really receive that information. And the insurance companies don't really reach out to our community to tell them where the services are. So it becomes, you know, almost impossible for folks to receive the services that they need. So we're, we're doing all these various things. Um, I have a picture there of the report that just came out um, in January. It's 190 pages with incredible amounts of information. I encourage you to take a look at it, read through it. The other wonderful bonus of it is that we've highlighted Latino artists. So it's kind of a unique report in that not only does it have incredible information, but it has, it's beautiful. <laughs> so I just wanna say that. And, and so that's all I wanted to share on this piece, but there are a variety of places where where people can be involved. Thank you, Linda. And I think you, you hit the key point right there. It's the it's people being involved. And I think the earlier we create a pipeline for individuals to be involved, the better. Um, most of us, at least years ago, I did not understand that concept that what do you mean you go volunteer at your city committee and all these things. And it's getting more and more people involved and in getting because you understand you get to learn a lot about just even at those volunteer positions before hopefully any of them take the next step to the next level. 
Well, uh, we're going to, I'm going to turn it back to our host here because I'm sure there's looks like we've got quite a bit of questions here and hopefully we can get some of them addressed by the panel. So I'll turn it back to our hosts. Thank you, everybody. You did a great job. Gracias. Um, we didn't get much questions. So you guys did a fantastic job either on chat or on uh, YouTube. But I have a couple of follow up questions with you folks, if, if I may. I want to start with Ernesto on affordable housing um, and see if you agree with me, Ernesto. One of the things about affordable housing is, is, is the model traditionally is for a two bedroom apartment on a sliding fee scale. That, that, that's a raw definition of affordable housing. Right? And I bring that up because uh, last November, the voters voted at a state level as the affordable housing measure with funds for construction, Metro and Washington County. And one of the, my concerns is that uh, when they go to look at eligibility for those uh, appointments is that they're using what they call the average income for the area as opposed to the federal income poverty guidelines. Um, that's one concern. The other one has to do with uh, Nuestra Comunidad needs more than two bedrooms. We need three and four bedroom apartments. We, we can't, two bedrooms isn't gonna do much good for us uh, unless we pile all the kids in that one bedroom. So uh, any, am I making any sense or, 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 or what's, what's your, what do you think? What well, um there are a couple of things here that you mentioned. The income average uh, formula, it's only for the projects. For the actual qualification of the residents that will be living in our communities, that is not the case. So you will continue to pay only 30% of your income. Uh, that's if you are down to 60% of the area median income in general. So you will be only paying 30%. You by law should not be charged and cannot be charged in any of our projects or any affordable housing development over 30%. If you are in, the, in a lower bracket, 30% AMI, the area median income altogether, you will be charged a lot less and sometimes nothing at all. Now, the issue of uh, affordable housing availability for Latino families that meet our needs, you are absolutely right. That is not the case with Hacienda, by the way. You know, we do studios, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, and four bedrooms, and occasionally we do the five bedroom units. Not necessarily, uh, we don't have a lot of five bedroom units, but we do have a good number of them and a lot of four bedrooms, and a, the bulk of our units are three bedroom units. More than that, apartments are uh, a thing of urban areas, and that is primarily because it is very expensive, the, the, the building in, in areas such as Portland, Beaverton, Hillsboro, Gresham, land is precious and it's just very pricey. So we need to build up as opposed to building out. But when you look at the models that we're putting together for Umatilla County, that will be townhomes at the most. Those will be the high density ones. And most of them are going to be single family homes, affordable housing, just like we do in Arizona. The model that we have in Arizona, for example, we have a lot of, you know, when you get close to downtowns, we have, you know, four, four stories, five stories maximum, but everything else, even within the urban area, we have, you know, single family homes or townhomes. At the most, you will see two houses stick together, but that's it, because that is the type of living that they like there. The type of living that many families like in urban communities in Oregon, it's precisely that, you know, single family homes, townhomes at the most. So that's what we're, we are going to be doing in those areas. And that's even one more reason that we need to invest much more in culturally specific developers. You know, we, uh, everybody talks about Hacienda or Bienestar in Hillsborough or any other communities, but really, you know, the, the, the the organizations that understand the needs of these communities are not necessarily all of these, you know, larger developers out there. It is us are serving our communities. We're trying to expand to every community that we can and try to serve other, even other communities. We serve a large number of Somali communities and the Muslim community in our main campuses. And we're trying to understand exactly what their housing needs are. But when you get a traditional affordable housing developer that is focus on the bottom line. We need to deliver as many houses 
per dollar. That is a valid point, okay? Don't get me wrong. That's a model. They should continue to do their thing. That is not what works for us. We need to invest in developers like us, or we need to invest even more so on us, you know, the haciendas of Oregon. Now, I, I don't want to advocate simply for Hacienda. I think we need to create more organizations like ours across the state so we can create a healthy competition, a healthy body of, of projects all the way across the, the Northwest, not just Oregon. Because, you know, if we are by ourselves playing, in, playing, playing this game of developer across the state, which I'm ready for it and I'm trying to do it, uh, I, I will be happy to do it, but it, won't, it wouldn't be the healthiest way of developing most of our communities because you're going to have one single hacienda doing a bunch of projects. That is not the way to do it. For me, it's expanding that capacity across the board, creating more professionals, creating more administrators, creating more developers in which we can really make a difference. You know, Maria Rubio is about to get her first property and I am so excited that she is going to join the real estate business. And this is a profitable business that has a really interesting and beautiful social purpose in terms of affordable housing dollars. So if you want to see more housing that is cultural specific or that understand at least some of the needs of the Latino community and other minorities, you need to come to us and we can work with some of those individuals that are working in your community. Uh, we're looking into the Phoenix area to uh, do more development there, uh, but we're just starting conversations you know, uh, as we speak. So those are my two cents in terms of uh, affordable housing. But I want to mention something quickly that I think is extremely important about what Linda said. Um, the political power, uh, and this in regards to a question that Melissa asked, uh, the political power that we built as Latinos is very, very fragile in these stages. And when we build power, you know, the, 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 the traditional political forces or groups in power will start to push back. I don't think we need to relieve the history that we went through in California and New Mexico and Arizona, relieve that here in Oregon. We need to look at those lessons that we got there. Once Latinos started to gain a lot of power in Arizona, the, 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 the conservatives started to push harder and harder and harder. That's why you see a lot of crazy bills coming of Arizona sometimes. Those, you know, these people that are losing power are just screaming and trying to push us as far as they can. They can't. You know, don't get me wrong, they can't. You know, the progressive Latin movement in Arizona is the strongest as ever and will continue to grow. We're almost 50%. In Oregon, we need to look at those lessons and understand that even though we're building power with Latinas, with Latinos, with the Latinx and the Latin community, we don't have it yet. We have to continue to build and stay strong and join forces with our minorities so we can really push for the stars and be able to resist a little bit more the push that is going to come once they see the power that Latinos have in this country. Great, thank you. Polo, you have a question over there for us? I do. Um, uh, let me say first, uh, Hector, you need to um, mute. There we go, thank you. Um, you may also need to just turn off your sound, Hector, because I'm hearing myself. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Ernesto, uh, Hector, and Linda for your explanations, but also for your inspiration. It's uh, startling how much expertise, um, how much goodness we have in this panel in front of us. Uh, I have another question that requires a different kind of approach. And uh, this is a questioner from WhatsApp. Uh, she's Latina from a family, from a familia divided by religion. And I think we can all acknowledge um, that old world folks coming to, as new Americans have a deep spiritual longing uh, that may be qualitatively different uh, from people settled here longer. And this um, uh, question uh, for you all uh, has to do with uh, her family and her seeing her community as deeply divided among uh, um, uh, religious traditions, uh, religious traditions new to her family. So I'm not certain what she's talking about. Are folks leaving the Catholic Church? Are folks becoming evangelicals, um, belonging to the Church of Latter-day Saints and the like? Uh, but she is quite distressed 
about this kind of thing, uh, hurting her and hurting her family and actually uh, tearing them apart. Do folks have a point of view on this? I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and just uh, start with, you know, one of the things that's true about our community is that our, our cultural traditions and our customs a lot of times are intertwined with our faith. And so a lot of generational um, expectations, a lot of gender roles are part of our upbringing and the church. And while the Catholic church is, is probably the one that's most associated with uh, the Latino community, we also need to recognize that there's a lot of other spiritual and um, a lot of other other ways of, of uh, believing or, or expressing um, their belief. I do think that that there is a generational um, um, ongoing balancing act that 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 I've seen. I see it. I saw it when I worked in education and where it was a, a, a family. Uh, deciding to let their their in this case it was a Latina uh, move on to campus to live in a dorm, and that whole concept really went against a lot of these beliefs and traditions, and and so it was it was a lot of listening and a lot of of providing space for for um, for 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 having people listen and hear each other. So uh, I do think it's a real part of, of um, our, our community when we think of sort of, um, when we think of church, when we think of faith, when we think of religion, uh, when we think of gender roles, when we think of sexuality, when we think of identity, all of those things are part of, of um, conversations now and I think it is hard for parents, for, for grandparents to participate in those conversations when the terms are also changing. So it's, it, that would be just sort of my response to acknowledge that that is a, a real situation. It's also a real opportunity because I think it, it's, it's not a, about dismissing or disregarding, it's really about incorporating and sort of building. So I'll, I'll stop there. Someone else can add. Yeah, please. Can anyone else add their um, wisdom? This is Anthony. So Woodburn, we have the most uh, per capita um, in, in Oregon. And uh, there's like 28 churches or 30 churches in Oregon, in Woodburn, and ma majority Latino, uh, mainly Christian based. And um, so I, I think, I think you know, I understand that conflict. You know, I have three college age students and we all grew up one faith and they're questioning that, you know, and so, but I think, you know, there, there is, there, there could be, um, you know, conflict, but I, I, I see that as opportunity for growth and learning on both of our ends. And we've had great conversations. Now I know not all, every family is different. Um, I'm just, that's just how I am, but I, I can definitely see, uh, and, you know, what David's saying, there are some deep rooted, right? Uh, faith is really powerful. And um, I think with our young our people with uh, technology and um, different just exposure to a lot of different types of people. We have Russian old believers here. And it's really interesting when my kids were growing up in my history of my life, I've never had a Russian old believer over my house. I walked into my house one day and there's two Russian old believer girls having a conversation actually about faith with my other two daughters, with my two daughters. And that was really interesting. I just kind of hung out in the kitchen and was just just uh, amazed about that, you know, the learning and growth that was going on and the respect. So I think the other side of it is that is that um, that through um, sometimes darkness, you know, light, you know, is shines on on some of these conversations. And I think that in the long run, um, if if you're if you, if you know that, I guess I believe that things will work out the way they're supposed to work out. So. And I just I just wanted to add with our with our new generation of what we call, we call mexillennials. I mean, they bring a whole new different way of looking at uh, gender non-binary, you know, identities. And for some of our community, that's really difficult to have that conversation. Um, and for 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 those young folks, 
it becomes a crisis of faith of really feeling they have to choose between their religious beliefs and their inclusion within a community and being accepted by their family. It's, it's truly a, a really difficult crisis. And we also start to see a growing um, contingent of folks who are very, very conservative in their beliefs, who are very uh, starting to also lean more in the Republican uh, side of things. And so it also divides families where it was hugely historically democratic, where we have folks who are very conservative, Republican, you know, very supportive of past candidates. Uh, um, and, you know, folks are really questioning, like, how could you believe in that if that particular party has been so uh, destructive to our community? So I think there's a lot of very um, difficult conversations that folks are having around the table, including some of the things that have happened in the Catholic Church around non-protection of of youth and, and other folks. And so I think it's a pretty active ongoing conversation that folks are having. Thank you, Linda and Anthony. Um, thank you, David. Uh, yes, uh, we're starting to run out of time, so we're gonna start wrapping it up. But before we do, Cecilia, I have one quick one for you. Uh, one of my concerns is, um, the National Labor Relations Act, which affords all of us the right to act in concert and form a union for the purpose of collective bargaining for terms and conditions of employment. That act, which is a federal act, uh, exempts agricultural workers or campesinos. Um, one of the things that Cesar Chavez had to do in California was to literally take the National Labor Relations Act, change the name to Agricultural Labor Relations Act, in order to get the recognition at the state level, legislative level, to be able to uh, uh, organize the workers. That's the only state that has it. We don't have it here in Oregon or other states. It seems to me that that is clearly one of those unsocial or social justice or discrimination in my humble opinion. Um, what say you? I agree with you, Hector. I think that um, that's also a very, um, important issue that we need to bring because our uh, agriculture workers do work in our, our workforce labor in our agriculture. Yeah, they have, they don't have the, the, all the benefits that they should uh, have, for example, um, healthcare um, and, and, and the, the wages the wages is not even near what um, what they deserve, and so I do agree with that. That we need to push um, in, in, here in the state of Oregon um, to make sure that our farm worker community have uh, that opportunity uh, for that, because that is a social justice issue. I said, absolutely. I was muted again. Um, before we get off, uh, Polo, uh, can you uh, start wrapping it up for us? And, uh, and we'll close her out, por favor. Thank you, Hector. Um, and even thank you more, uh, Melissa, for taking uh, care of our panelists, for uh, curating these questions, keeping things moving. Uh, your momentum is, uh, is, uh, co is so compelling. Uh, we're going to start paying you the big bucks pretty soon if we can keep you nearby. Uh, we need this kind of energy. Uh, we need this kind of optimism. Thank you, Melissa, for uh, for seeing us through this uh, 90 minutes or so of really intense uh, conversation. Uh, thank you, all panel members, Linda, uh, Ernesto, David, uh, Maria, Cecilia, of course, uh, Anthony, uh, for bringing your um, uh, must be 200 years uh, of insight, of experience, and inspiration uh, to us tonight. Um, let uh, me say some things and then hand it over to Sho, and then hand it over to Wajdi, who will um, uh, uh, close and send you all home uh, in, in peace and hopefully safe. Um, uh, New Portland Foundation is looking for financial sponsors and partners. I think uh, for folks watching our presentation tonight, 
I hope folks are impressed with the spiritual, the social, and the cultural wealth you all have brought, panelists. This is what our families have always brought to America. And I like to believe that America longs for this wealth as much as we long for the ATM cards, a mortgage out in the suburbs, um, and I don't know, entry into the, into the stock market. I'm suggesting to those folks who, uh, who do command the political wealth, who do command financial wealth, philanthropic wealth, the kinds of networks and institutional power that Hector and the rest of our panel have been talking about today, can see the beauty of blending the wealth we own, the wealth we have banks and banks of, and how cool it would be to have a joint bank account of this institutional wealth, material wealth, political wealth, with the spiritual, cultural, and social wealth um, we own uh, uh, so well. Um, with that, uh, please know that we will have these discussions uh, for at least five more events during the year. Uh, our uh, financial sponsors and political uh, partners, governmental units and alike, um, let us hear from you. Uh, let's work with you. This is so much better than the nearly 40 years I've spent lawyering uh, suing governmental units. You know, that's never been a way to integrate America. That just creates more bitterness and America needs no more bitterness. What America needs is what we've heard tonight. All these voices talking about integrating and blending and mixing. The fix is always in the mix. Uh, so, uh, Show Dozona San, uh, president of uh, our board of directors at New Portland Foundation. Thanks for staying up so late. I'm going to hand it to you. Uh, Big Uncle Show, your audio is still off. Sorry. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you very much for all the, all the discussions. I learned a lot uh, as a immigrant myself seven years ago, most of uh, Having picked berries with the uh, fellow immigrants uh, and sent uh, through myself through college. But you, you folks were amazing panelists, and I hope the, all the audience learned a lot from all of all of your wisdom and, and your experiences. So I'm really very pleased that this is uh, our very first uh, outing for NPF to do this and uh, this. Uh, all I meant to have four more following this, and I want to turn this over to Bajai for his comments and, and ending prayer. Bajai, go ahead. Bajai, your, your mic is turned off. For me, as a Yemeni American and Arab American and Muslim American, I felt home seeing my beloved sisters and my beloved uh, brothers and uh, the beauty and uh, and uh, the color of uh, our Latino world is, uh, is so beautiful and so diverse and yet uh, it's very complicated like you know like the African world like the Asian world like any other world you know and this is the beauty of our human story but one thing that we can do especially those of us that lives here in, in Oregon in Portland in the state of Oregon, that uh, the opportunity is in front of us to uh, to claim the narrative, the beloved community narrative. You know, uh, we are uh, today, you know, are multi generations, you know, uh, of great leaders. You know, my beautiful uh, sister Linda Castillo has, uh, uh, in her slides, give uh, so many opportunities, in respect of our religiosities, in respect of our. Uh, you know, our affiliation, I think it's possible that we claim the narrative of healing and unifying. So today we want a commitment from each one of you, from each one of us, you know, that we will be a source of healing and unifying. And let us put our differences aside, you know, uh, and let us focus in the big picture 
that you know we are as a migrant, we are as indigenous people, we are of uh, whatever background are, we can be uh, we can be part of the solution. So uh, let me end with a peaceful uh, prayer. You know, in our tradition, in the Muslim tradition, that we always seek, you know, from our Creator, the Sustainer, the Provider, the Most Merciful, the Most Compassionate, that we say, Oh God, you are the Most Merciful, you are the Most Compassionate. From you comes peace, and into you is peace. Show us the path, a path of those that you have been blessed. Make us peaceful makers. I'm very thankful to... Uh, Again, to our uh, Melissa Bobadia, our board member of the New Portland Foundation. I posted the New Portland uh, Foundation uh, website, newportland.foundation. And uh, I'm very thankful to our uh, beloved brother, uh, David Martinez, beloved sister Linda Castillo, beloved sister Maria Robio that I have known since I came to Portland for 34 years, my beloved brother Ernesto, you know, and my beloved brother Anthony, and my beloved sister Cecilia, and my beloved brother Hector, and, and so many others. And we are very thankful to our Mayor Calloway from the city of Hillsborough, our Sheriff Garrett from Washington County, our former councilman from, uh, from Lake Swego, Jeff Godman, and so many other people, you know, that we have reached the peak, you know, with, with Facebook and YouTube and WhatsApp. and Twitter, you know, and here we reach almost 618 people that are interested in the Latino story. The next one will be the African story. And the next after that will be the African American and then the indigenous people. And we'll wrap up with the, with Europe. And, and hopefully we, we have covered as much as we could as the new Portland in partnership with the Muslim Education Trust. Thank you very much, Hector Hanosa, And thank you very much, Paulo, as well, and Sho Dizano. We're, we're finishing up a little early, so thank you, everybody. We're on target, on schedule. You all did great. For you women, it's uh, time to celebrate Women's Month. Uh, gracias por todo lo que hacen. I appreciate it. Thank next you, everybody. Week. Adios. Until next time. Yeah, next week we have the International Women's Day in November, uh, March 18th, 10 to 12. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all.